Welcome everyone to the webinar today. My name is Samantha Nino and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Excella. We're so excited that you're here today with us. Welcome, this is the Defense from the Inside Out, a talk about the immune system, the, the gut, and what you can do to improve them. This isn't gonna be your average science lecture. You'll be introduced to a cast of immune system characters, as well as gut microbiome characters. Our goal is to help demystify how these important systems are connected and what you can do now to build your own defenses. So before we get started though, we have a few housekeeping things. One, we have a large group on today's webinar. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat window and we'll do our best to answer all the questions at the end of the webinar. And if we don't, if we're not able to answer all the questions, we'll be sure to email you after the webinar. And then two, since we're working from our home offices, um, the internet can be unstable at times. So if the screen freezes, just hold tight. We'll, we'll return in just a few seconds, we'll get back on track. So I, I, with that, I think we're ready. I am so happy to introduce our featured speaker today. Her name is Dr. Erica Ebel Engel, and Erica is the CEO and co-founder of Excella, the internal fitness company. She received her PhD in biochemistry in 2012 from Boston University School of Medicine and holds a Bachelor of Science degree from MIT. Erica values community and civic involvement and shares her time in a variety of civic groups, including as a member of the MIT Visiting Committee, and for the Dean in Undergraduate Education. She is also a STEM speaker for the US Speaker Program at the US Department of State. She's been recognized for her innovation and leadership over the years, including the Young Alumni Awarded by Boston University, the Distinguished Alumni Award from Boston University School of Medicine, Division of Graduate Medical Sciences, and by the Boston Business Journal's 40 under 40 businesses and civic leaders who are making a major impact in their community. Erica's love of science started as a kid reading Jurassic Park and going on school field trips to the zoo. Because of her passion and curiosity for science, she founded Science from Scientists, an award-winning national nonprofit focused on improving STEM ap attitudes and aptitudes for middle school students by sending real charismatic scientists into classrooms to make science fun and engaging. She wholeheartedly believes that science should be accessible for all. With that, please welcome Dr. Erica Ebel Engel. Thank you so much, Sam, and welcome everyone. I know we have folks from uh, all around the country, all around the globe. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am super excited to be talking uh, about some pretty amazing uh, uh, areas of science today. We're going to be talking about the gut, about the immune system, about how the two are interrelated to each other, and then ultimately a little bit about how you can improve them. Um, at Excella, we are extremely passionate uh, about the gut. Uh, many of us have been struggling with gut-related issues for our entire lives. Uh, I know that I've been dealing with IBS for a long time, and I think that that is what really drove me to want to understand the gut more and uh, ultimately to found a business around it. So I was extremely fortunate to meet my uh, co-founder, Wayne Matson, uh, here on the right, who is a phenomenal individual. He has dedicated his life to this field uh, of, of really understanding gut health and uh, preventative medicine. Um, he has both been an entrepreneur, founding a company, uh, ultimately around some of the technology that we use at the company. Um, he's been a research scientist, a consultant for pharma, uh, some of the really kind of cool stories about him. Um, he, he holds hundreds of patents uh, and has been published in, in literally hundreds of, of papers uh, in cooperation with the CDC in the 1970s. He actually developed a lead test that was used to screen children for lead levels that was used globally. Um, during that time, there was an epidemic, and so he invented that test. Uh, our, and also, he's even worked with folks uh, at NASA looking at DNA damage markers in some of the uh, astronauts up in the International uh, Space Station. 
Over the course of his 50 years in this industry, you know, he has been involved with hundreds of different research studies. Um, this is just a partial list of some of the research institutions that he has been a part of, again, as a consultant, as a research scientist, um, you know, doing various types of metabolomics work. Uh, across these 50 years, his lab has studied you know, pick a, uh, pick, a, pick a disease, we've probably studied it at some point. There's a partial list again here, everything from the neurodegenerative disease family, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, Huntington's, to heart disease and diabetes, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, GI disorders, uh, bone density issues, cancers, autoimmune conditions, and more. So, um, just really briefly, and this, this is on topic, you know, growing up, Sam had mentioned, I was very passionate uh, about viruses. This is actually a picture of me in, in 10th grade at an international science fair. If you look really, really closely in the title, you'll see that there's a, the mention of something antiviral. Um, I was given the somewhat dubious distinction in middle school of being the virus girl, uh, loving to read books like The Andromeda Strain and The Hot Zone. Uh, this was not particularly great for uh, my, my social life, as you can possibly imagine, being the virus girl, especially the, the virus I was studying was actually the herpes virus. So you can imagine how popular that, that made me. But the good news is that it was actually super, super helpful in uh, helping me to understand and explore and explain the immune system. So who would have known that this would be um, a part of my life that would actually be helping now many years later. So today we have a fairly ambitious agenda. We're going to be talking about a variety of things. We're going to be talking about uh, the attackers. I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. Uh, we're going to talk about the immune system. What is the immune system? How does it work? Why is it important? Then we're going to talk about the gut and the gut microbiome. What is it? How does it work? Why is it important? And then ultimately, how is that interrelated you know, to your immune system? We're gonna provide some general tips on what you can do to improve your gut health. And then at the end, for those who are interested and you are not forced to stay by any means, we'll talk for about 10 to 15 minutes about uh, Excella, what Excella does and how uh, Excella could potentially help you if you are struggling with any of these problems. So first, let's talk a little bit about your body. So your body is under attack constantly from many different types of pathogens, things that are trying to infiltrate. These types of attackers include things like, for example, viruses. I've listed a few here. Uh, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, influenza, of course, uh, virus that causes the flu. Norovirus, you've probably heard of this one. It is something that you hear about cruise ships struggling with. It's the stomach flu that infects certain types of cells in the GI tracts, give you, gives you diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. And other viruses uh, like Ebola, one that I was really fascinated with as a child. Again, you've probably heard in the news in the last couple of years, these outbreaks. Ebola is a, a particularly um, devastating but intriguing virus that targets specific types of cells uh, that line your blood vessels, causing you ultimately to bleed out if you end up infected with it. Also, um, separate from viruses, very different type of pathogen and microorganism called a bacteria. Uh, bacteria, things like, for example, pneumonia that, that infect your lungs, uh, strep throat, which uh, could potentially, if left untreated, lead to different types of heart problems and even scarlet fever often in children. So right now, as we all I'm sure are aware, um, we are dealing with the COVID-19 epidemic. We have uh, sort of coined this term that, that our COVID uh, virus is public enemy number one. On the left-hand side, you see a rendering of what that virus looks like. We, for the sake of this presentation, have uh, given the virus a little bit more of a, a colorful, colorful uh, look, uh, but you will see COVID-19 make an appearance throughout the course of this presentation. I truly believe that in order to understand how the immune system works and to understand our defenses, we must actually understand our attackers as well. And of course, as the virus girl, uh, I can't really resist in sharing some information about what viruses are. So 
viruses are really cool because they are um, they're ultimately parasites. They require other types of creatures to, to live in. So they are biological agents that reproduce inside of other types of cells of living hosts. They are tiny. They're thousands of times smaller than bacteria. They are, if you look at the, that ruler, they are about a millionth of an inch in diameter. So they're very, very small. And they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes from round to worm-like to even spider-like, like in this image. They are, again, really neat because they don't have the actual chemical machinery necessary to carry out life on their own. They actually require another organism to come into to infect. Uh, they hijack that organism and then they essentially make that organism make more virus. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And so scientists are always talking and having these discussions around, well, you know, are, are these viruses actually alive by definition because they require a host in order to survive? So we're going to take a little bit of time to explain how viruses replicate, again, just so that you can uh, start to have a picture of what happens when your body is infiltrated by them. Um, like I mentioned before, viruses actually trick our immune systems into um, realizing that they're not there and then hijack our cells to do their dirty work. So it starts with essentially a virus coming up to a specific cell. We'll have to travel throughout the body to find the exact and specific match to itself. So if you look on that purple little virus, you see those red little kind of dots on the outside edge. So these are receptors, almost like keys, that when that virus finds the right type of cell, it's able to adhere onto that cell. So you know, viruses like COVID-19 are upper respiratory tract infectors, so they're looking for cells in your, in your nose and your lungs that fit that, that match. When they attach onto the cell, it's almost like they're turning a doorknob. And the cell thinks, oh, okay, this is something that actually belongs here. I should let it inside me. So the virus cleverly enters the cell. Once it's inside, it disassembles assembles or it uncoats, it takes off its, its clothes, it kind of disassembles into all of its different genetic material. And you can imagine at that point, there are pieces of virus lying around, whether they be DNA, whether they be RNA, and the cell, unbeknownst to the cell, of course, the cell is doing its normal cell-related activities, it is trying to uh, divide and, and, you know, and cells, that's what they do, they try to divide and grow. Well, as it picks up genetic material from outside of its nucleus, thinking, oh, here's some potential DNA I can use in order to do the processes that I need to do, it inadvertently picks up some of the viral DNA. And that viral DNA, once incorporated into the cell's DNA, is essentially instructions for how that cell should create more virus. So the cell ends up manufacturing thousands, millions of viral particles, they reassemble and go out, shoot out through the cell, sometimes you know, killing the cell, obviously, as they exit. Now, now that they've exited the cell, they're carrying with them that cell's membrane, which makes it really difficult for the immune system, ultimately, to identify that they are virus. So they are now kind of hidden uh, inside that cell's coating. They then continue to infect um, other cells around them by just, you know, traveling around and adhering to another cell and infecting other cells. So one of the things that you've probably heard a lot about in recent weeks is the importance of, you know, washing your hands. Well, why is that important? So it's, it's not just you wash your hands to, you know, get rid of virus on your hands. Ultimately, that cell protective barrier around the virus is made of a lipid or a fat. Uh, and when you use soap and water, you're actually dissolving that lipid membrane, that fat, and exposing the bit on the inside, which can't live very long without it. So by washing your hands, you're actually dissolving that membrane, exposing the virus, and rendering it inactive. We talk a lot about why COVID-19 is a really well-designed virus. Um, I've mentioned it lightly, but the idea is that it has a very long latency period, meaning that it hides out 
in the person for many, many weeks before that person even shows symptoms. Sometimes they don't show symptoms. That means that person has the ability to go and infect lots of other people before that individual realizes that they've actually even come down with the virus. And that's why it's, it's very dangerous because it just has the ability to spread uh, in ways that other viruses do not. So we talked about Ebola earlier, Ebola being a very devastating uh, virus, but because it kills its host so quickly, um, it is not a particularly well-designed virus because that host does not have a lot of time to go and spread the virus uh, around to other members of the community. So, you know, ultimately, again, thank you for working from home. This is a, a time where we're, you know, trying desperately to allow our healthcare system to do what it needs to do um, and to help those people who are going to react very negatively to the virus. Um, I saw this post, I thought it was actually uh, somewhat entertaining. Uh, for the first time in history, you can help save humanity by sitting on the couch, watching TV and surfing the internet. For God's sake, don't mess this up. So again, thank you to everybody for taking this seriously and hoping that we can uh, move beyond this epidemic as quickly as possible. So again, the best line of defense, obviously, is to never come in contact with the virus, with the attacker. Um, unfortunately, this isn't always possible. And these are statistics for COVID-19, but they're really statistics for many viruses, right? Um, they can survive for a few hours outside, uh, four hours on copper, about a day on paper and cardboard, and about three days on plastic and stainless steel. So, you know, we're, we're drawing a lot of attention to this right now because of COVID, but many viruses follow the same uh, general trend. So regardless of whether, you know, you get infected or come in contact with COVID, um, you're going to be coming in contact with many other types of things um, throughout the course of really, you know, your life. And it's very important to be prepared for that. So this is where we move into a little bit of a conversation around the immune system. So your body's immune system obviously protects you when these various attackers uh, make contact. And what is quite remarkable is that the immune system is able to help prevent you from being infected by millions of, of organisms and microorganisms every day. So it's not just like one here and one there. Um, it's literally millions of things that you are exposed to. And so I've tried to come up with a simple way of thinking about this very complex system. The immune system you know, is in insanely complex, but to give a general idea, here's some, here's some thoughts on it. So very loosely, your immune system is comprised of three different areas. So the first are barriers. So these are uh, essentially uh, metaphorical ways of describing ways that your body protects you from the attackers. We'll talk more about each of these as well later, but these are the three systems, factories. Factories which in your body help to produce the immune system. And then of course the armies themselves, which fight against the attackers and the pathogens. So we're gonna start with the barriers. We're gonna provide a couple of different examples of different types of barriers. So first of all, you have your skin. Right, so the skin protects you from, protects the inside from the outside. Things don't readily get through your skin. Um, it is a protective barrier from the outside world. Then you have your mucus. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about mucus uh, later in the presentation, but mucus is essentially a very a thick and sticky material that's found in your nose, in your lungs, in your intestines. It essentially is there to capture various types of uh, pathogens to prevent them from being able to go out into the rest of your body. So it traps them and it forms a barrier between the inside and the outside, allowing your immune system to come in and ultimately uh, attack those different pathogens. Your gut, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on this. Um, your gut is essentially a, a closed system, at least it's supposed to be, and we'll talk about when that goes wrong. But it doesn't allow things, again, 
as they're going through to, to get out. And thus, it, it really protects you from being infected by these different types of attackers. 70 to 80 percent of your immune system is found in your gut, and so it's extremely critical to protecting you. So let's talk a little bit about your factories, places where various parts of your immune system are manufactured. You have your thymus gland where T cells mature. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, all these different cell types, but T cells ultimately are the part, the armies of your immune system, which are able to go out and um, signal to the rest of your immune system that something is wrong. Your spleen, which regulates how much blood is in your body. You don't want to have too much or too little, and it removes damaged cells from the system. Your bone marrow, which manufactures and produces white blood cells, white blood cells uh, of many different types exist. They're the ones who actually fight the pathogens directly. Bone marrow produces them and, and releases them. And then again, we come back to the gut. So like I said before, huge percentage of the immune system is found here, but it also helps to produce many of those types of cells and regulate the immune system. Lastly, you have your army, and these are the actual cells of the immune system. Um, many different types. You've got your swordsmen, you've got your axemen, you've got your, uh, your archers and your, your horsemen. And again, they all serve a very unique and uh, distinctive purpose. So you're going to be, we're going to be talking about a variety of different cells um, found in the gut. Um, here you've got your T cells. We've talked about them a little bit before. Uh, we could teach an entire year-long class on the hundreds of different types of, of T cells that exist in the body, but ultimately they are responsible for activating your immune system. So they're the messengers. You have B cells, which help to produce antibodies. Antibodies are those molecules that actually go out and attack and neutralize your pathogens. You've got your natural killer cells, which are almost like snipers. They are specifically seeking out viral cells and tumor cells. You have your macrophages. So macrophages, if you imagine, are almost like Pac-Men that travel around the body, eating different types of bacteria, fungi, and viruses, dissolving them into, uh, into things that get repurposed. And then ultimately dendrite cells. And we're gonna show some neat images of how dendrite cells work, but they're able to go into the gut and determine what specific type of pathogen is infiltrating and then uh, communicate that to the rest of the immune system, um, telling the specific type of cell that needs to be there, what needs to be done. And so again, you know, I think that the purpose of this talk is to really drive home this point that the gut is so important and often very much neglected. And it's important because all three of these things that we've talked about, the barriers, the protection, the manufacturing of your immune system, and the immune system itself, the soldiers themselves, all three are found in the gut. And if your gut's unhealthy, that obviously is going to trickle down and affect the way that your body is performing in all different you know, manners of ways. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, we say, oh, 70 to 80% of the immune system is found in the gut. And you probably are thinking, how is that possible? How does that even work? So let's talk about that. Also, just to call attention, this is a really neat image in the background of this slide. Um, this actually is, if you imagine that you're looking down your small intestine and it's sort of a cross-sectional look, um, you can see these finger-like projections are what are called microvilli. We're going to talk about them a little bit more, but they're lining, they're single cell, they're lining the, uh, the, your intestine. Here, this, this person is um, probably not going to be too happy very soon. These circular objects that are um, touching the microvilli are, are viruses. This person might be on their way to getting the norovirus, but I think that this is a, a neat image just so that you can imagine what the inside of the small intestine looks like. So here we've created another kind of cross section. It's not looking this way. It's sort of having chopped it this way and turning it sideways. So you can see the little microvilli of the cells here. So we're gonna talk about the four areas of the gut. 
So you have your actual gut lining cells, which are called the intestinal epithelium, your mucosal barrier. Remember that the mucus, so you have a mucosal, very thin mucosal barrier. This isn't entirely drawn to scale, but it's here to make a point of uh, protecting that very thin intestinal epithelium, those cells. You have your systemic circulation. So these are the vessels that take your blood all around the rest of the body. And you have an area between called the lamina propria. And this is where your immune system uh, ultimately hangs out. So we will go through all areas. So the various cells that make up your intestinal epithelium include enterocytes. So these are responsible for absorbing the nutrients that you take in from your food. They're the ones that have these, these microvilli, these, these finger-like projections. The purpose is to increase the amount of surface area you have in order to absorb the nutrients. Uh, each microvillus in the finger has various different blood vessels that connect that particular cell to your systemic circulation. So let's say you've eaten a taco for lunch and the good bacteria which are living in your mucus have now broken down that taco into its various component parts. Things like, for example, tryptophan, which is an amino acid from the, the beef in your taco. Those metabolites are then uh, drifted into the microvilli. They're absorbed through the microvilli. They travel into those little blood vessels those blood vessels then go into your systemic circulation and take those nutrients all around to the rest of the body where they're utilized for you know, many, many important things, including building your immune system and you know, building other structures in the body. You have panth cells. Panth cells produce what are called antimicrobial peptides. So these are small proteins that are specifically geared towards destroying bad bacteria. You then have goblet cells. So as their name suggests, they produce gobs of mucus. They're the ones that help to create that lining. And you have enteroendocrine cells. So these cells produce hormones. Again, we always talk about, you know, is the gut connected to other systems health? Very much so. In this case, some of these cells are producing important hormones. In between your cells, you have structures called tight junctions. We're going to be coming back to these fairly frequently in this presentation. These tight junctions prevent things from going through your intestinal epithelium. And they're extremely important because they hold those cells together. What can happen if you damage your gut, and we'll talk about that as well, is that these junctions can break or they can loosen, letting food and particles through when they're not supposed to be. So imagine you've eaten your taco, your bacteria have broken, uh, broken down the taco into various metabolites. Those metabolites are now going through the cells in the wrong way. And your immune system, of course, in your lamina propria is seeing them and thinking, I don't know what this is. Your immune system has never seen a taco before. And the immune system decides that, that those molecules are in fact foreign uh, because it doesn't know better. The immune system starts to attack those molecules and ultimately uh, this can cause allergies over repeated insult uh, because after a while your immune system thinks this is a, I need to fight this taco um, and can also lead to various autoimmune conditions because you're just constantly fighting against uh, everything. So leaky gut is a very bad thing to have. Also, it allows particles, uh, viruses, bad bacteria, things to pass through, which can increase the likelihood of your getting illness and infection. So like we mentioned before, um, in the lamina propria, your immune system lies in wait. Um, many of the same players that we've talked about before, your T cells ready to have a conversation and signal the immune system when it needs to go, get moving. Uh, your B cells, which are making antibodies, like we mentioned before, your natural killer cells, uh, your macrophages ready to go and Pac-Man eat up all the, all, the, all the pathogens and the dendrite cells. So here's where we'll show a little bit of an image. So the dendrite cell has almost like a, a foot um, that it extends through the uh, intestinal epithelium and it waits for bad bacteria or pathogens of any kind to adhere on. When that happens, that signals the dendrite cell to say, uh-oh, there's a, there's a pathogen of X type 
um, I need to go and mobilize the forces of the immune system to go and address this. And so the dendrite cell is a little bit of a command center uh, telling the rest of the immune system what it needs to do. So again, your gut is many things. It isn't just a barrier that protects you against infection. It's a factory that is turning all the foods, the tacos that you're eating into the various building blocks that enables the construction of your army and frankly, all the rest of your body, all the tissues of your body, they have to come from somewhere. Um, and that is this concept of, you know, what you put in is essentially what you're building. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different molecules that you do get from dietary intake that help to build this immune system or helps to build your, your army. So the first is tryptophan. Um, I'm sure folks have heard about this. Yep. Go ahead. You have probably heard of the tryptophan uh, induced coma that comes after Thanksgiving. Uh, tryptophan is a very, very important amino acid molecule that you must get from your diet. Um, it plays a whole assortment of different roles. Tryptophan is found in many sources of food, things like eggs, fish, chia seeds, spinach, um, obviously different types of nuts and tofu. Now tryptophan is taken in by your body and is converted to a whole variety of different molecules. Kynurenine for one, which actually helps to regulate antibody production. Again, antibodies are the ones that go out and fight pathogens. Um, kynurenine also has antimicrobial properties. Super important for fighting, fighting uh, pathogens. Indole 3 acetic acid, also a product, a byproduct of tryptophan metabolism. They help to regulate T cell function and helps to balance the immune system's response to various infections and threats. Tryptophan is also converted to serotonin, incredibly important to help regulate gut motility so that you have constant bowel movements. Um, also can help to protect your body against infections, helps to regulate mucosal inflammation and permeability, um, also is the happiness molecule, right? And then Serotonin is converted to a molecule called melatonin, super important to help you sleep. Also extremely important with helping to maintain those tight junctions between your cells in the intestinal lining so that you don't get infected. So if you imagine you're not getting enough tryptophan in your diet, you're more susceptible to illness, you've got some, some challenges um, with, with stool and, and bowel movements, and you're not necessarily going to be able to get the high quality sleep that you want. Another example of a, a very important molecule called indole 3-lactic acid uh, is found in fermented foods. Things like pickles, things like kombucha and kefir and uh, sauerkrauts. These are it, it's super important. This molecule is actually taken in by certain species of bacteria in your gut called Clostridium sporogenes. Those bacteria convert your ILA into a molecule called IPA or indole propionic acid. Indole propionic acid is one of the strongest antioxidants in the body. What is an antioxidant? Well, so when your normal cellular processes are happening, one of the byproducts of this is, is a molecule called a free radical. It's very common. They're just sort of waste products of your normal cellular processes but they are dangerous because if they react with cells, they react with DNA, they can cause cell damage, they can cause mutations, they can cause cancer. So antioxidants come in and they try to neutralize or negate those free radicals. IPA is also really important for helping your immune system to combat pathogens. So good gut health. Very important. One, because you want to try to prevent intestinal permeability. You want to keep those tight junctions tight. So good gut health helps to fortify that barrier. It helps to provide the nutrients your body needs. So it fuels the factory. And then it helps to protect your immune system. So it helps to protect your army. 
Thus, one of the most important things we can do to help our immune system is to improve our gut health. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's, let's talk about the gut. For starters, what is the gut? So the gut microbiome is everything from your mouth to your colon, entry to exit, we like to say, uh, your esophagus, your stomach, your small and your large intestine, and all the critters that live in there. So that includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, cells, everything that makes up that uh, diverse ecosystem that's found in, in your small and large intestine. And diversity is key. Now we talk about what is a good bacteria and what is a bad bacteria, but in reality, there's a, a Darwinian competition that is occurring in this ecosystem that is helping to regulate you know, each species so that none of them overgrow, none of them overpower the rest. They're living in this very complex ecosystem and thus it is important to have a diverse microbiome. There are dozens of research studies that show that if you have a healthy gut and a diverse gut, good things happen. You have energy, you don't get sick as often, you have good emotional well-being, mental clarity, and many research studies that are showing that if you have poor gut health, it's linked to things like anxiety, depression, uh, diabetes, obesity, autoimmune conditions, and even now things like Alzheimer's. And your gut is very much affected by what you do. You have a fair amount of control um, through your diet, through your lifestyle, and through mindfulness. So probably all throughout your life, um, you know, I don't know if your, your parents tried to foist Brussels sprouts on you as a child, then you said, I don't really want to uh, eat this. And they were telling you, you are what you eat. But the reality is, it's completely true. You are what you eat. Eating poorly can do two pretty bad things. One, if you don't eat foods with the right nutrients, um, you're not going to get the right nutrients needed to keep you healthy. And then also, you have the ability in eating poorly to actually change the composition of your gut microbiome, uh, which then makes it impossible for you to break down the nutrients. So even if you're eating the right foods, if your gut is damaged with the wrong composition of bacteria, you're not going to be able to, to break them down and get those nutrients that you need. And so obviously eating good foods is necessary, but not sufficient. You need your gut to be healthy in order to uh, successfully do these conversion processes to get you the nutrients that you need. So we try to illustrate this here uh, imagine if you are a reasonably healthy person with a reasonably diverse microbiome and you've got critters in there that digest veggies and meats and breads and, and such. If you were to now change your diet and eat foods that are only high in, let's say, fats or breads, what you've now done is you've given competitive advantage to those species in the gut. You've helped them to grow more and you have now skewed the ratios um, and you could potentially even outcompete the, let's say, the, the, the bacteria that digest vegetables into oblivion. Typically, that doesn't happen, but it could take months to actually restore the proper levels of bacteria uh, in, in the gut. So again, another way of looking at this, the silhouette on the right-hand side, you can see the little critters down below are trying to take in the foods that you're, you're, you're eating and to produce the molecules that you need to stay healthy, but there aren't enough of them, right? So that you just, you have no diversity. So there's an imbalance, a dysbiosis. On the left side, you have a different situation. That silhouette has different types of bacteria, all there able to take in and digest the different foods that you're eating, allowing you to get the building blocks you need to be healthy. Unfortunately, there are many gut lethal things we do uh, in our lifestyle. I would admit I'm an offender. We're working from home and there's, you know, chips sitting around and you feel like the need to go and eat them. Um, unfortunately, you don't find many nutrients in, in many of those. Uh, the sedentary lifestyle that we live, obviously we, we don't move around a lot. Um, exercise is incredibly important. It can help to produce antibodies. It can help to produce white blood cells. Um, and ultimately it's good for your heart health, right? And for uh, keeping you regular. So exercise is so critical. Stress, 
Uh, stress is huge. You know, we will at some point likely do a whole um, one hour, you know, piece on stress, but stress kills the microbiome. Um, and you say, how does that work? Well, your nervous system, your enteric nervous system is actually connected through a nerve from your, from your head to your gut. And so when you feel anxiety in your head, why is it that you often feel butterflies in your stomach or nausea or digestive distress where you suddenly you know, have to run to the bathroom or, or not, or you're constipated? Well, it's because the two systems talk to each other all the time and they're very tightly connected. So stress here leads to stress there, stress there leads to stress up here, very intimately connected. Um, Specific ways stress affects the microbiome, like we've mentioned, digestion is inhibited, so it increases and decreases. Um, you know, this can cause things like ulcers. Uh, stress also increases blood cholesterol, which is typically not particularly great. Um, on the immune system side, stress inhibits your ability to create different types of cells. It also uh, creates uh, levels of, of cortisol that are much higher than they should be. And typically cortisol is produced in a sort of a fight or flight state. And uh, as a result, you know, say you're running away from a mountain lion, um, you want your body to focus more on that fight or flight rather than on your immune system. So that gets suppressed. But if you're constantly in a state of fight or flight, then obviously your body is not spending the time that it needs uh, on its immune system. You have immune system suppression that increases inflammation uh, and that is ultimately long-term bad for you. Uh, it also decreases the amount of white blood cells that you're producing. Antibiotics, um, obviously a very important uh, uh, medication. Um, so not to say it isn't, but uh, unfortunately antibiotics don't, can't tell the difference between good and bad bacteria. And the tendency is if you've been on antibiotics for a light, long time for them to wipe out uh, your microbiome. And sometimes it doesn't rebuild properly. So what can we do? Good news, it is possible to improve the gut through many of the things that we've suggested. So by changing your diet, by incorporating, you know, mindfulness and exercise. And then, you know, I, I think it's very important to say that if you uh, need a specific supplement, then it makes sense to take it. You know, we believe very strongly that you should only take things if you know that you need them. Um, but targeted supplementation can definitely help. For example, I went in, I had low vitamin D, how was I going to get vitamin D here in New England when it was raining and, and freezing? Um, so it was necessary because my levels showed I needed it to take it. So we're going to provide just a couple of general nutrition recommendations. Again, these are, these are general um, bell peppers. They're a great source of vitamin C and fiber. They're great for improving the integrity of the gut. Protein, of course, super important because from protein come all the different amino acids that are used by your body to do many, many things, to, to build muscle mass, to build strong immune systems, etc. cetera. Uh, ginger is a wonderful anti-inflammatory uh, agent. It helps to maintain that integrity of your gut lining uh, and is just a, a great... Uh, ingredient to to cook with on the fitness side there's not a lot of science that specifically states that you know if you do sit-ups or or kettle raises that is going to improve a specific type of bacteria in the gut but what we do know is that uh, variety of movement is really important so it's important to have restorative movements stretching resting walking outside foam rolling some cardio get your heart uh, get your heart moving and then just Strength training, right? Uh, body weight exercises, uh, super important to build that strength. So just diversity in your exercises. On the mindfulness side, um, you know, everyone's slightly different what it takes for them to wind down, but one to two hours before sleep, try to turn off all your devices, get some good rest, do some breathing exercises. We, we have this tactical breathing five, 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 you know, inhale for five, hold, exhale for five, hold, do it again. Um, these are so important for promoting great digestion and rest and mindful eating. You know, you have an opportunity right now to, to choose the types of foods that you're eating. Um, when possible, 
swap the Doritos for, for healthier types of choices. And this had been a question, you know, are there specific supplements that we recommend at this time? And again, these are general recommendations. Um, vitamin C is, is been studied, uh, has been studied quite extensively. Um, vitamin C helps to stimulate your white blood cells. Those are the ones that go out and fight pathogens. Zinc is good for cell growth, cell division, re uh, restoring that mucosal barrier in your GI tract, helping with antibody production. And um, probiotics, you know, I, I'd say on a case-by-case -case basis, um, it, it, this one's a little more complicated, but, you know, if you've been sick, if you've been on an antibiotic or a medicine, um, not a bad idea to try to support the population diversity of your gut. Try to find a probiotic that has as many species as possible, again, so that you're not giving preferential advantage to any given one. Um, and that, that isn't so strong that it's overpowering to the body. So, you know, 15 strains, 30 billion CFUs. So obviously there are many things that you can do to help your gut, but at the end of the day, um, what should you do? And this is where it is incredibly important to understand your gut in order to provide personalized recommendations, suggestions, and strategies to improve it. So this is where we will take a little bit of a pause. Um, ultimately, this is what Excella does. This is, you know, uh, what we've been working on for the last 50 years with Wayne's research. You are by no means, uh, you do not need to stay if you do not want to hear this. It's about another 10, 12 minutes of presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope that the, the first part of this presentation was, was helpful and useful for you. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. Um, for those who are willing to stay, we will carry on. So again, you know, I think that what is really critical to understand, if you want to, to do something to improve your own health, you have to know where you've started. If you, if you don't know what your baseline is, it's very difficult to make any kind of meaningful change. So we believe in the importance of starting uh, with a measurement. Ultimately, Excella is a pinprick blood test. Uh, you poke your finger, you bleed a small volume of blood on a, a collection device, you close it up, you send it in. From there, we provide you with personalized results. We're going to show some of what that is, but this is high level. Personalized results and plans. If you're in our subscription, we retest you every 90 days just to see whether or not these recommendations have been working, have been helpful. Uh, and we provide uh, personalized supplements, um, only those that your data show you need. And those are included as part of the package. Basically, what we do is we give you your specific metabolite levels, high, low, and in range for the 11 markers that we're testing. We'll talk a little bit at the end about what those are, how we got there. Um, we've also been able to map these specific molecules to the five areas of health where they play an important role. So these are molecules that are not just critical to gut health, they're important for your immune system health. Um, we talked about some of them earlier in the presentation. They're important for your emotional health, for your brain health. Um, uh, energetic health, everything, this is critical. And then a profile tracker so that you can track your progress over time. You receive personalized nutrition recommendations uh, on a variety of, in a variety of different areas based on those metabolites, uh, fitness plans, so they're 90 day fitness plans that are designed by uh, Olympic caliber trainers. Uh, mindfulness recommendations, so ways to rest and relax, including uh, meditation, uh, tips, breathing exercises, etc. Uh, and then ultimately a list of the different supplements that we're recommending. Um, we tell you everything about them, why they're recommended. Ultimately, you could go and purchase them, you know, somewhere else if you'd like. If you don't want to be in, in our program, we try to be very transparent about that. We also have uh, customer resources, so an exercise and workout library. So depending on what your, um, your report recommended, you can go and let's say you don't know how to do a specific type of exercise. There are videos for all of them present on, on the portal. 
Um, if you don't have access to you know, traditional gym equipment, but you do have, uh, you know, you're, you want to work out obviously at home, there's, there's home workout plans as well that don't require any specific equipment. There's a recipe library that takes the different ingredients that we've recommended and combines them into dozens of different uh, tasty recipes. You can filter those by metabolite. You can filter those by dietary preference. And then we have a whole section on just content. Um, we have doctors, traditional you know, doctors and scientists who write for us to provide you with as much information as possible around why is this important um, and what you can do about it. So there's just a lot of curated content um, vetted by uh, well-respected science folk. So there was a question um, I saw just pop up briefly about what's the technology, what's the assay, and um, ultimately how did we get to the metabolites? We're going to talk a little bit more about that briefly. So the assay that we're using is uh, electrochemistry. The device is called the Coolaray. This is a device that Wayne invented at his former company. Uh, that company was then sold and is now owned by a very large biotech uh, Thermo Fisher scientific uh, so that technology is still available today. Ultimately, how we got to these metabolites, if you remember back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, Wayne, over the course of his 50 years in this industry, having worked across all those different disease states, um, took blood, urine, CSF, feces, I mean, all different types of samples, and they, we run them on this instrument. So typically what happens is the blood or, or the, the specific... Uh, material is injected into the auto sampler. It travels through a column, which ultimately, if you imagine, is almost like a colander. Uh, if you were to fill a colander with different size marbles and then pour some other marbles on the top, you know, depending on their size or if they got cut up, things would be trapped in that colander and would come out at different speeds. The column serves to separate all of the different material that's found in your blood as it goes through. As the, the various analytes go through the column, they're separated, they enter the cool array. If you were to open up the cool array, you look inside, you see these four rectangles down below. And if you look carefully, each of those four has a vertical, almost like a, um, it's, it's essentially an electrode, but there's a vertical uh, little slat uh, at each of those four slats and there's four and four, so there's 16 total, you can set a specific potential, a specific amount of energy that essentially zaps the compound as it comes through. And if that compound is electrochemically reactive, it appears as a peak um, on the screen uh, adjacent. So we're going to dig in a little bit more to that. So if you can imagine over the course of this, these 50 years, um, when we've been part of a specific study, you compare he healthy versus unhealthy or disease versus control thousands of times. So you've got your control here at the top. Uh, at the bottom, you have a sample from a patient with Huntington's disease. As you can see, there are similarities. Um, that's to be expected because these are, um, these are both humans, uh, but somebody has a, a debilitating neurodegenerative disease, whereas the other person does not. So you're going to be expecting to see differences in their molecules, in their metabolites. But imagine for each study, you do this a thousand times. So healthy versus unhealthy. You take this data and you export it as what is called a digital map. So this is a numeric representation of that chromatogram that you just saw. You can take all those digital maps and you put them into a statistical analysis program, uh, something like, for example, MATLAB. And you can say to it, what is different between healthy and unhealthy or disease versus control? Which peaks most uniquely identify and distinguish those two groups? And so here you can see from the list, the VIP list or the variables of important list, uh, importance list, these partic six particular peaks that are highlighted. Uh, just from those alone, you're able to separate your Huntington's disease, uh, which are circled in green, from your controls. This is actually a very common process for uh, pharmaceutical companies that are doing drug discovery. This is how they learn often about the biochemistry of a disease. They take healthy and unhealthy. They compare them. They look for the specific metabolomic differences between them. And then they say, oh, okay, if you have this condition, then something has happened 
in this biochemical pathway. Let's create a drug or an intervention to try to address that. So this is a fairly common uh, way of doing this type of work. Um, so again, based on these now 30 to 40,000 samples that, that Wayne has run across uh, his entire career, what we started to see was that there were trends. There were certain molecules that kept coming up over and over again across all these different studies that were either risk factors for certain types of conditions, disease progression markers, or you know, ultimately just overall markers of good health and wellness. And when we took a step back and said, gee, this is kind of interesting, the same thing coming up over and over again, um, where do these things come from? And they were related to the microbiome. And so ultimately that is how we became a microbiome company. So these are molecules, again, that are either um, secreted by certain bacteria in the gut. They're things that are regulated by the gut. So for example, uh, serotonin, everybody thinks serotonin yeah, is a brain molecule. 90% of serotonin actually comes from the gut. It's secreted by uh, a specific type of cell called the enterochromaffin cell in the gut. Um, or, you know, based on your body's ability to just digest and process that taco, um, they are a measurement of the output and functionality of the gut. Uh, all of the molecules, of course, had to be stable at very small volumes. Um, this was a, a science challenge for us, but we, we got it to work um, and to be able to be sent to us in a, as a dried blood spot. And then ultimately all of them had to be actionable. Um, one of the most annoying things I find is if you take a test and then someone says, well, there's nothing you can do about it. So then what, what was the point of my doing the test to begin with? So all 11 uh, are actionable through, you know, diet and mindfulness and, and exercise, et cetera. This is a list of our uh, 11 molecules. You can read more about them uh, on the website. Uh, but I think what, what makes us uh, really unique is, you know, we're still on the side um, involved in a lot of different research projects because um, if you were to go on PubMed and start to research these more, um, they're, they're quite uh, well-known and, and acknowledged, though they're not sort of common household names for, for being things that are very relevant to gut and brain health. So we had been asked the question, who uses this test? We, we have all kinds of different um, you know, folks who do from literally uh, performance uh, oriented people, health professionals, doctors, traditional, you know, GI doctors, endocrinologists, to um, Ayurvedic Chinese medical uh, practitioners, everybody wanting to get a little bit more insight and data into what is the state of their gut and what can I actually do about it? So we've got fitness folks, health professionals, nutritionists, trainers, professional athletes and teams, and a number of research collaborations uh, still in, in uh, happening, one with an ALS Institute here in Boston, one with UCLA Medical uh, School on IBS and IBD looking at our markers, um, also one with uh, Duke University looking at our markers for ischemic heart disease, um, and a number of others as well. So uh, it's, it's been a, a reasonably useful tool for a pretty broad group of folks. So again, thank you so much for, for listening. Um, if you're interested in learning more, please go take a look on the website, take a look at our content. Uh, if you're interested in the test or the subscription we're offering, and since you stayed with us throughout uh, the course of this presentation, we're offering a coupon, uh, immunity. Uh, use that in the checkout. It will get you a $25 coupon uh, for the test or, or the program. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna take a few questions um, but wishing you all excellent health and a lovely day. Excellent. Thank you so much, Erica. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Great. One um, is, can you explain the fasting increases microbial diversity or why fasting increases microbial diversity? Let me think about that. Okay. Um, Let's take the next one. Let me think about that. Is, sure. is, there a study, I would, is there a study that has shown that fasting increases microbial diversity? Mm. And this is something that we can follow up with our registered dietitian as well. Um, sure. So if we have their name or email, we can make sure that we follow up with mm -hmm. a short amount of time. We, we sure. do have one more question that we can do quick. Does being a vegetarian make it more challenging to keep your gut healthy? Or is, there, or is it the other way around? That's a great question. So 
it makes it different. So one of the things that we commonly see amongst our vegetarians is that they're not getting enough protein intake. So, you know, vegetarians will often think, well, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm a vegetarian, it's not good to eat a lot of red meat. Um, there's always a pro and a con to everything. Uh, many of our vegetarians struggle because they're not getting enough protein. Uh, animal protein has you know, significantly more protein content. You have, you have to eat a lot more beans, let's put it that way. So um, I, I think the answer is many of our vegetarian clients will report fatigue, uh, exhaustion, not having great sleep. And typically that's because it starts at the very top. If you don't have enough tryptophan right, in your diet, then you're not producing enough serotonin, you're not producing enough melatonin. So, you know, I'd say for vegetarians especially, it's really important to know, am I getting enough? And the only way to know is to, is to test. And on that point, for, for the Excella test, for our vegetarians, for our vegans, for folks that have special food preferences, we actually have our report and recommendations catered to those needs so that you get recommendations on foods that align with your food preferences. Great, thanks, Sam. Yeah, and you know, I was think so thinking about this question um, regarding fasting. You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to, we'd have to look that up. But if I had to guess, you know, fasting has been shown to be healthy for a whole variety of reasons. Um, to some extent, it probably allows your gut microbiome a chance to rest and recuperate a little bit, um, which could, you know, if you are, if maybe some re-regulation. So it may actually, it may allow some rest um, and, 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 and maybe in, in that capacity it helps. Excellent. We had a few more questions come in. Um, would you recommend taking supplements at night before bed and before your body begins to rebuild during sleep? Um, Depends on the supplement. Um, you know, supplements, some of the supplements like B's, um, D's recommended to be taken in the morning because they are sort of energy related. If you take them at night, it might interfere with your sleep. Obviously, taking melatonin during the day is not a good idea. So it does, it depends. Um, there's a little bit of, of data suggesting that taking a probiotic at night is better just because you're not eating, right? So it gives, gives your gut a chance to sort of catch up because there's nothing going on. So it's, it's but I think um, it really depends on the supplement. And we'll do one more and then we, we should break. But um, I go to a homeopathic doctor and he says not to eat gl eggs, gluten, and dairy because viruses feed on it. Is this true? Viruses would not feed on eggs, gluten, and dairy because they're not a host that they're, that doesn't, scientifically that doesn't make sense, right? So the virus needs a host cell to reproduce. Viruses aren't technically alive. They don't eat food the way bacteria do or the way our cells do. So what, so no, um, that, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Um, I'm trying to think of what perhaps could have been meant by the statement. Um, you know, if your gut is leaky, if you have allergies to some of these foods and typically because these are foods that we eat very often, it tends, these tend to be the types of things that we are most sensitive to, right? Because we're constantly eating them. Um, I, I would say though that that is where you're more likely, maybe your immune system is more likely to take a hit because if you have leaky gut, the viruses, you know, in the image that we showed, the viruses are able to sneak through and infect you, but the viruses themselves don't, don't infect. So that, that it's not quite right what the statement was. Okay. Well, thank you. And we had some great questions. If we weren't able to address your question during the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with you. If you liked this webinar, or if you didn't like it, we'd love to hear your feedback. Please fill out the post webinar survey. And if you enjoyed this webinar, we're going to do this again next Thursday. So please invite your friends and colleagues. We'll send you the link that you can share. But we would love your help in getting the word out so we can um, make make more um, make an impact in the world and educating about how the immune system 
is tied to gut health and what you can do about it other than just hand washing and doing social distancing. So thank you again for your time today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being curious. We are really appreciative of, of your time. Anything else, Erica, that you'd like to, to add? No, thank you again so much. And um, again, we, we want to make sure all questions are answered. So we will, we will do that just being cognizant of, of people's time. So um, thank you so much again and best wishes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.